So we're in the book of Galatians today, and we're going to be preaching from, uh, learning from Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 20. Now, I, I understand that not every family has the same dynamics to them, that if you attend a family gathering, maybe you're invited to a family gathering that isn't really your family, there might be some interesting dynamics that you discover at such a gathering. So each family has its own unique interests, I suppose. But one of the things that our family, I remember since the time I was a little boy, whenever our family would get together, one of the things we like to do is we like to hear the older people in the room tell us how crazy their childhoods were. So I remember my dad would tell us all the stunts and things that he got himself into growing up, and we'd split a gut hearing him tell these stories. And as I've grown older, my brothers and sisters have grown older, our kids are often hearing the, the stories of the crazy things that we did. And generally we're, we're laughing and we're, we're reminiscing and we're kind of remembering all that nutty stuff. But the reality is, as I've thought about it, many of those things that we laugh about now weren't actually funny when they were happening. The fights, the, the, the challenges, the, the trouble we got into wasn't particularly funny in the moment, but when we look back 20, 30, 40 years, suddenly it's like, that was hilarious. Now, psychologists actually have a name for this. It's called rosy retrospection. So when we look back retrospectively, it's true that many of us tend to forget the bad or even the neutral, and we just remember the good times for the most part. We, we laugh about things that weren't particularly laughable then. Well, in the Christian life, it's also possible that we might at times look back with rosy retrospection on our pre-salvation years, maybe long for some of the things we used to get to do, some of the places we used to go, some of the people we used to chum with. This is why, if you listen carefully, when people who have had dramatic conversion experiences tell their testimonies and people are all leaning in with awe, oh, wow, you did that, you did that, there, so, sometimes it almost unduly highlights the bad sinful things that people did almost as if, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun back then, robbing banks or committing adultery or stealing or whatever it might've have, might have been. And this is something we have to be really careful of as Christians. Sometimes people can look back with rosy retrospection on their previous lives and over time they're attracted back into it. They start to backslide, as we say. They start to fall away and they forsake the Lord in their walk. So Paul had to address this issue among the Galatian churches in the first century. And essentially, it forces us to ask the question, am I taking my salvation for granted? Do I have fond memories of all the things I gave up for Jesus? Or do I acknowledge them for what they are? Dark and putrid and unhelpful and things I don't ever want to do, say, or think about again. Sometimes we should look back, but when we do, we should be reminded that we don't ever want to go back there. In Galatians 4, verse 8, the text opens as follows. Formerly, thinking of your former life, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. So the text opens up with a reminder that prior to encountering the true and living Lord Jesus Christ, we were all enslaved to destruction, to addictive thoughts, to addictive feelings, maybe to addictive substances. We were hopeless. We were selfish. And any of the pleasure that we were experiencing back, back then was merely temporary. I received a text from a dear friend at 3 a.m. this morning 
who has not yet given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And laced throughout the series of texts I received was just a man crying out for help who has yet to dedicate his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I get these about once a year from him. And I've known him since I was essentially born. That's where we came from. Hopelessness, bitterness, anger, lost, confused, ignorant. We don't want to go back to that. Do you know the Bible never on any single occasion speaks in glowing terms of anyone's life before salvation at all? And yet again, sometimes believers turn back and find the old ways attractive. So to the early church, the Bible says, but now, so we already read the verse about formerly, so this is a contrast now. But now that you have come to know God, or to be more precise, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? We may find it somewhat hard to believe, but people who've been liberated and freed from sin or tyranny, when they forget how bad it was, tend to, in their pursuit of comfort, go back to it. We actually see this even in human history. And I personally think we're seeing it in the moment where we have it so easy or we've had it so easy for a few generations, these liberties and God-given freedoms, which millions of men and women died for in World War I and World War II, that we take them for granted. And over time, we become lazy and unwilling to take the stand that they took. And we, we want to be coddled. We want to be babied. And when the nanny state offers that, we're quickly willing to give up our liberty and freedom because someone else is going to take care of me. We, we see that in, in social order. And I think we see it as well in our spiritual lives that it's so easy to turn back to that which at the time was not satisfying us, was not life-giving, was not filled with hope, was chaotic and ignorant and destructive. We turn back to that because it's easier to live in chaos than it is to maintain order. It's, it's easier to run with the herd, so to speak, than it is to, to walk away from the herd and say, no, I, I'm going to live for God. So Paul here has to make some correctives to what he had seen taking place in the Galatian church. And if you've been tracking with us in Galatians, one of the cr critical errors that he was concerned the Galatian Christians were making is that they were taking the laws of God, which previously they'd, they'd been under, and they were turning back and trying to impose moral righteousness, civil, life, uh, um, civil laws upon new converts, distracting them from grace and, and, and pressing them to sort of earn or measure up in some way to, to, th to their salvation. So he's definitely speaking to Christians here. These are the kind of people who were, were real converts. It says you knew God, or rather more precisely, you were known by God. By the way, that, that's really important. Knowing God isn't just knowledge of. Knowing God also involves a relationship, intimacy with, surrender to God. And these people had that. But lest they fell into the trap once they had it, of thinking it was just their bright idea to pursue it or to go after it, he corrects that and he quickly attributes their knowledge to a passive tense. We could say that they knew God passively because God knew them first actively. So God was the first to walk up and put out his hand and make the introduction and pull us toward himself. This is really critical in our understanding of salvation. 
We're not robots. We're not unaware of what's going on. But God's the one that walked up and initiated the relationship. He's the one that put out his hand and took ours. So Paul makes that little correction there. Their old life prior to knowing God and being known by God is described as weak and worthless. It's enslaving. It's enslaving. When you put yourself under endless rules in order to try to make things right or please or appease God, it's it does the opposite. It not only displeases God because you reject his grace, but it also, it also puts you on that hamster wheel that I've often talked about of endless efforts that kind of lead nowhere. It's weak, it's worthless. The text also addresses the fact that there's a desire issue. Notice it uses the word want. They wanted it meaning that they had a desire for the old life that had overtaken them. So by the way, we have to be cognizant, aware of not only stinking thinking, but also where the desires of our hearts are pulling us. And sometimes Christians aren't, frankly, I don't think introspective enough. We need to be aware of when the desires of our heart may be pulling, luring. We're starting to, our hearts are starting to be enlarged and sort of drawn back into the old ways. So here Paul is sort of exposing what he observes in them. Now here's here's the expression. This is probably not yours, but this is the expression of that desire for the old life that he observed in the Galatian church. He said, you observe days and months and seasons and years. That's in verse 10. They were, one of the things they were doing is they were looking back to all the different legislated ceremonies and celebrations, the days, the months, the yearly festivals with admiration, practicing those evidently in order to somehow be a good Christian. Perhaps some of these Jewish feasts and maybe even pagan festivals, because some of them undoubtedly came out of paganism. They weren't all previously Jews, had involved Lies and falsehood, lies like, well, this is maybe a good luck festival, or if we celebrate this festival, we're going to get health, wealth, and prosperity. There's many different things that are celebrated in culture that aren't worth celebrating. There's some things taking place this month in our country that are celebratory, but they're not actually worth celebrating. They're worth denouncing, but not celebrating. So for this reason, even in the, mo- in the modern context, by the way, this is a little sidebar minor point. Christians are right to be skeptical of secular holidays and the messages that they bear. But I don't think by way of direct application that most of you are teetering on the verge of falling away from Christ because you're celebrating Jewish festivals or celebrating pagan festivals, but there are other aspects perhaps of our old lives or our old relationships or our old perspectives on money that may be seeking to captivate our hearts. So as I rub shoulders with my fellow Canadians and with my church and as I consider my own life, I think there are some things about our past that at times might be a little dangerous, a little bit attractive, One of them is the pursuit of pleasure for the sake of the pursuit of pleasure. We live in a pleasure-saturated world from the time we're young. It's like, if it feels good, do it. Remember that? If it feels good, do it. And when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's supposed to be a life of joy and true pleasure, but it's not a pleasure that merely feeds the flesh. It's a pleasure that feeds the soul and that is vertical in nature, that seeks to honor God and bring him the glory that he is due. And yet we live in a culture where many Christians, and I've mentioned this to you, I think a week or two ago, even as we fight against the tyranny of the moment and the godlessness of the moment, sometimes it, it crosses my mind, like are Christians fighting these things simply because they want to get back to a life of comfort and ease? Or are they fighting them because they're wrong? What's your motive? Is your desire just to get back to the old normal? You know, where you can 
walk your dog and go where you want, worship when you want, and work how you want. There's nothing wrong with comfort in and of itself, but we mustn't ever allow it to control us or dictate our priorities. And frankly, we all know through the eyes of faith that God uses discomfort, probably more than comfort, to sanctify us. So we have to do some self-assessment in that regard. Yes, it might have been more pleasurable from a fleshly perspective when we weren't saved, when we weren't walking with Christ. But what about the pleasure and joy of serving Christ in the here now and laying it all down for him and sacrificing for him and being used of by him to see people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Folks, even some of our religious commitments can become what I would call spiritualized selfishness. I go to church because I feel good when I leave. I go to church because someone remembered my name. It's like my cheers bar. I go to church because they minister to my kids. What do you do for the church? How are you contributing to Christ? This isn't a spectator sport. And we're not interested in creating consumers here. But pleasure can be a huge idol. Another thing that I think sometimes Christians make the mistake of falling back into is their, their best buddies, their friends, their circles of influence often are chocked full of unbelievers. Now, there's nothing wrong with building relationships with unbelievers for the sake of sharing the gospel and being Christ to them in the way that you interact. But if your closest friends, your closest friend circle literally worship a different God than you do. That's dangerous. Their priorities are different than your priorities. The Proverbs tell us that he who walks with wise men will be wise. So what's the opposite? He who walks with fools will be foolish. We rub off on each other. So we have to be careful not to necessarily write off our old friends or our unbelieving family members just because we're Christians now. But at the same time, if our most intimate friendships, our most intimate fellowship is with people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's where we find our relational satisfaction, that can draw us away from Christ. The people that you hang out with, the people that you associate with will inevitably and necessarily influence you. That's the nature of a relationship. It's never one way. It's always two way. The, 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 the influence is always flowing back and forth. It's also possible that at times Christians fall back into their old habits, their old addictions, their old language. It's like, well, I'm a Christian now, so, you know, I have have grace, I have the assurance of salvation, so it's not a big deal if I still have a foul mouth, or it's not a big deal if I'm an alcoholic, or it's not a big deal if I'm addicted to tobacco, or addicted to food, or view a little porn now and again, because after all, I got my ticket to heaven. This is that licentiousness that the Bible condemns over and over again. And while there's always going to be temptations in our lives, when we give in, we're just like, I'm resolving that this is just my thing, or I'm going to pursue this particular sin because after all, God is gracious. That's an abuse of the gospel. And it may actually be indicative that you're not regenerate. So a Christian is going to sin, but a Christian is never going to be comfortable sinning. Never. They're going to be convicted. They're going to seek to overcome their past addictions or sins, not drag them back into the present. So in order to walk in grace, we need to be humble and confess our sins daily to the Lord when we mess up, but never feel comfortable falling back into the old ways. So if you have a foul mouth, if you're a blasphemer, if you're an addict, if you're a liar, if you're dishonest, if you're unfaithful, you need to clean up your act. You can never be satisfied or comfortable with those things. How about this one? Quitting, backsliding, failing to persevere. Folks, it's a dangerous world. It's hard being a Christian. It's hard persevering. But let's not be sprinters. Let's be marathon runners. 
Let's see the big picture. Let's stay the course. We're each weak, vulnerable, susceptible to becoming enslaved again to any one of these things or many others. And unfortunately, the Galatian church largely had succumbed. So here's what Paul says to them in verse 11. I am afraid that I have labored over you in vain. All this ministry I did, was it for naught? <laughs> like, can we correct this? <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty bleak, abysmal assessment of the church. Now, I, I understand that, um, from best as I can tell, most of you are living large for Jesus. <laughs> and that's a, that's a great thing. This might just be a forewarning to you to avoid future temptation. But I suspect that in a crowd this large, there's probably a few folks out there that are dabbling in things they shouldn't be dabbling in, sort of perhaps sliding back into some of the old ways. So how do we, how do we correct this? Having received this warning, how do we correct this? Well, let, let's, let's begin by considering reminding ourselves of what we've been given. And I want to share with you four things that we see in the New Testament scriptures. These are from outside of Galatians that I think are worthy of much meditation. They include a new life, a new hope, a new lifestyle, and new priorities. These are things we should be thinking a lot about. A new life. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 The word of God says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Think about this when you're tempted. I'm not the man that I ultimately want to be, but I'm not the man that I once was. I'm a new creation. Christ has actually done something ontologically to me. He is changed my status. He's changed my interior. I'm indwelt with the spirit of God. I have new life in Christ. What does it say? I am a new creation. It's like in salvation, God doesn't just start throwing band-aids on us or pouring medication down our throat or doing surgery. He makes us new. The old ways are behind us and we are new creatures in Christ. Out of that flows a new hope in Romans 24. The first part of Romans 8, I should say, verse 24. For in this hope, we were saved. What's our hope? We have hope now that God will continue to endure, uh, sustain us and help us to persevere and that he'll continue to work in our lives. We also have the hope of eternal life. We have hope when things seem hopeless around us. There, There is a... Uh, a place to look at the world and assess the brokenness of our world and the evil in our world as hopeless pursuits or hopeless activities. But we have a certain optimism about us because we know that God has worked in our lives. He's working in other people's lives and we know how this all ends, folks. So we needn't fall into despair or discouragement But we can really get up every morning, even if it's gloomy and rainy and we're under stay-at-home orders, we've lost our job or we're ill with hope because of what God has accomplished in us. In Romans 6.14, we're called to a new lifestyle, a different way of living, of ordering our days. The Bible says we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we too might walk in newness of life. We, we say this to people when they come out of the baptismal waters to remind them that in Christ they've become dead to sin, but alive to walk in newness of life. That's directly from Romans 6 verse 4. We have a new lifestyle. We have a, we, we've been restored and made new in Christ. So we live differently. We have a new set of priorities. Colossians 3.1. If then you've been raised with Christ. So have you been? If then. If you have been, this is for you. 
Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We, we have a heavenly perspective on all of life. Our marriages are vertical marriages. Our budgets are vertical budgets. Our parenting is vertical parenting. Our vocations are vertical vocations. We do everything to the glory of God. What is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Not to glorify yourself and enjoy yourself forever, but to glorify God. This is that vertical mindset where everything we do is to the glory of God. Should I say it again? The mission of God is the glory of God. That's his ultimate mission. And we get to participate in that. So we have a new set of priorities. We think about things from a Christ-centered perspective. So if you think about the, the new life you possess, the new hope, the new outlook you have, the new lifestyle you're living, and the new priorities that you're putting into your schedules and, 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 and your thinking, this keeps you on track. This keeps you focused rather than falling back into the old ways. What happens when we look back? Well, the opposite happens. We're, we're re-enslaved. The world is the ultimate false advertiser. Sin is the ultimate false advertiser. It promises to liberate and free you and it only enslaves you. Look at our culture today. Why do we fight for liberty as Christians? We fight for liberty under God to use our freedoms within the boundaries that he has defined for us. And we constantly get pushback for that. Well, the world talks about liberty too. They have a very different view of my body, my choice. They want unfettered liberty to do whatever they want. And it always results in what? Not true liberty. It always result, results in destruction and enslavement in death. So you hear my body, my choice with regard to vaccinations. You hear my body, my choice with regard to the abortion movement. They're completely different. They're completely different. Well, if you guys want freedom to worship, we should have freedom to marry whoever we want. Isn't that fairsy squaresy? No, it's completely different. We want liberty under God to live out the God-given liberties that he's given to us, not to make up our own not to make up our new set of priorities, not to do whatever we want. So here's the thing. The old ways, the old ways, the earthly ways, the carnal ways, they promise liberty, but they always end up dominating you and enslaving you. It's like, I want the freedom to smoke, tote, and inject whatever I want. And then you meet them a year later and they're desperate to get out of it. Desperate to get out of it, to get out of their addictions because now they've been dominated by it. When we are slaves to God, we're slaves to righteousness and that always brings liberty and freedom. Remember Lot's wife? Why was she so fascinated with this disgusting place, Sodom and Gomorrah, that God had just let her out of? Because that's where her heart was. That's where her heart was. There was not life there. People banging on your door in the middle of the night to try to molest you and rape you. That, you want to go back to that? That's death. That's destruction. But that's where she'd given her heart to it. We have to be careful not to believe the lies of the world that when God's laws, God's principles, God's values are tossed aside, well, then there's true liberty. No, there's enslavement. That's the road to death. God's laws, God's word, God's values protect us, folks. So as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, remember, the reason why sin at its core is attractive and one of the, the things that sort of underlie all sin is this downplaying or denying of the goodness of God. God's a cosmic killjoy. He doesn't have my good best interest in mind. He's trying to hold, hold out on us. God's mean, so we're going to reject God and we're going to do our own thing and that's life, liberty, and freedom. Never happens. Never happens that way. Never happens that way. It always leads to destruction and enslavement. So not only when we, when we look back, 
are we re-enslaved, but we also injure other people. We become poor role models. We become a discouragement to others. Paul here demonstrates a measure of discouragement. He was a spiritual giant, a mature Christian, but he wasn't God. And he was kind of bummed out at the behavior that he'd witnessed in his fellow Christians. He says, brothers, this is verse 12. I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial for you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as as Christ Jesus. So he's looking back with fondness to trial he had. They'd met his needs. He'd met their needs. It was a mutually beneficial ministerial relationship that they had previously enjoyed, but then things change. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. So again, thinking back, now we don't actually know exactly what's going on here, but I suspect, if I may, remember Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. There's something about his physicality that, that, um, bothered him that was kind of like a, a thorn, it was some sort of a physical ailment. Maybe his vision was problematic. This would also explain why on a couple of occasions, like in Philemon 1.9, where he talks about, I'm actually writing this with my own hand. Okay, why is that so unusual? Many times, you know, Paul had to employ or did employ an amanuensis, a scribe, He would dictate and he would write for him. Maybe because he had some serious vision problems. This may may be what he's talking about when he has this bodily ailment. And the church at the time, if this is true, felt so bad for him. They were like, if, if we could gouge out our eyes and give them to you, we would. So that's probably what's going on. We're not gonna form a new denomination over that interpretation, but that's probably what's going on. So some good things had happened in the past, but then in verse 16, it says, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? So something has changed in you guys. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out. These are their, the false teachers that he'd already addressed that were coming and whispering sweet nothings in their ears, lies, telling them they needed to return to the circumcision rites and the Old Testament laws to find favor with God. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you. So if someone compliments you because you've done well, that's a compliment that's encouraging, but flattery is when you're complimented for no good purpose purpose. And false teachers are often pretty good at flattery, at making you feel good about yourself or that you have some sort of a special connection with them. But in reality, they're leading you astray. Again, appealing to your carnal base appetites. So Paul thinks back to the fond memories he has with this group of Christians. Again, he says, you do not scorn or despise me, but receive me as an angel from God. But then things change in verse 16, where he asks, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? (laughs) What happened between then and then? Between the first encounter and the second encounter? In the first encounter, they were still focused on salvation by grace through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were still recipients of and appreciative for God's grace in their lives. False teachers came and said, no, you got to start abiding by the old ways the old patterns, maybe the old festivals, the old circumcision rites, and then you're going to be okay with God. And they bought into that because these men were winsome. They were, they flattered them. They made much of them. So now Paul is pretty bummed out and he has to come back and make this correction, warn them, chastise them in order to push them back toward truth and righteousness. By the way, when Paul says, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth, there's a lesson in there for us. What is it? 
Be open to correction from people that love you. Be open to correction. All of us need to be corrected. I get corrected and I need it. You get corrected and you need it. If we truly love others, we're going to at times say, hey, you know what, bro, that's not true. Or you shouldn't have done that. Or you shouldn't have said that. And when you assess the person's motives, you might be like, well, who do you think you are? You're not perfect. And we cut the person off or we push them away. But the Bible says wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. An enemy makes you feel good about yourself. But a friend, not every day, not every moment, that would be a little overwhelming, but is prepared to wound you in order to correct you because they love you, just like a good parent. Good parents aren't licentious parents that allow their kids to do whatever they want. That's not a truly loving parent. That's a weak parent. That's a parent that doesn't see the big picture. That's a parent that's not willing to put in the hard work of disciplining their children into righteousness. We need to be open to being told the truth. And today, perhaps God is working in your life and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, it's probably true. I'm, I think I am looking back a little bit too much. I think I am maybe falling back into the old ways and I need, I need to be rebooted, so to speak. Well, I would encourage you, if that's true of you, to, to respond to God's correction and to move forward in his grace, to obey him, to trust in him, to rely upon him once again, just like you trusted him and him alone for your salvation. Trust in him, rely upon him, obey him. The old ways, they're not going to benefit you. Verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They don't lead you anywhere good. So folks, here's the message. Reject slavery. Reject slavery and look forward to what God has in store for you in the days and months to come. In verses 19 and 20, the text says, this is Galatians 4, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. In other words, I feel like I'm giving birth to you again. You know how the joy of raising kids, holding a baby, raising toddlers, getting them through school, seeing them grow and find jobs and careers and marriage, all starts with a very painful experience called childbirth. You don't really want to go back to that to get this, but you know this was necessary for this. Paul's like, I feel like I've had to go back now and I'm, Experiencing all this pain as if we're, we're, you're, you're, just, you're just being born. It's kind of a drag. He says, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone for I am perplexed about you. So the passage sort of ends on that down note. He's bummed out. He wants him to know. He's like, I'm disappointed in you. Frankly, I'm disappointed in you. It's not right. It's not fair. I shouldn't have to go back and tell you this over and over again. You should know better. But sometimes we do need to be corrected. Sometimes we do fall back. Sometimes those that have spoken truth into our lives have to come back and say, brother, sister, this isn't cool. You, you need to recenter yourself on God's grace. So essentially there's two kinds of Christians. The immature Christian is looking back with wistfulness. Oh, I wish it was, I wish I could go back to the old ways. It was so much fun before Jesus entered my life. Now I've got all these rules and regulations to live by. Just be reminded that was a life of slavery and darkness. This is a life of true liberty and light. So there's those that look back with wistfulness and then there's those that look forward with wisdom. And one of the takeaways is not just to assess ourselves, folks, but to, to press forward. Let's Let's choose to press forward. Let's choose to never step back. Let's not make the mistake of allowing sin to creep into our lives and, and take hold. So I, I don't know. I'm not preaching to any one of you in particular. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you know what's going on in your life. 
And if there have been some old patterns, some old ways of thinking, some old ways of speaking, some old ways of spending that have crept into your life and God is convicting you of those today, make the necessary changes and return to your first love. When you return to your first love, you'll experience the the joy of your salvation once again. And it's in that joy that there's true pleasure, true satisfaction and true perspective and true purpose. All of course, ultimately done to the glory and honor of God. 